Hello folks, welcome back to our channel and the first installment of the Filati Senior Series Playlist. I didn't know what else to call it. This is for older adults. I don't know if you like that name, Senior Series. I'm not crazy about it. Let me know what you think we should call it. Put a suggestion down in the comment section and we will change it if you like. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that we talk about issues that are relevant to older adults and provide practical solutions and that's what we're going to do today if you or someone you know is experiencing bothersome disruptive frequent urgent urination getting up too much at night not able to go out and do the things you used to like to do well you are in the right place you see in this video we're going to talk about some practical tips some strategies to help you manage overactive bladder and improve your quality of life doesn't that sound good let's get into it so what we're trying to do is muster the strength and determination of Rosie the Riveter. You remember that character? Well, that's you now. We have to make a decision that we're going to be proactive and take back control. It does require you actually do something, but not a, a lot of thing, just a, just a consistent small thing. Five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening. You can do this. Together, we can do this. What we're talking about is nothing less than preservation of your dignity and independence. What's more important than that? When it comes down to it, you have your quality of life. Are you willing to fight for it? Are you willing to do something to preserve it, maintain it, so you can do the kinds of things you've always liked doing, like travel, um, go to social gatherings without fear of not having a bathroom available, or do you not like traveling with a change of clothes all the time? Well, these are all huge issues and they can be overcome with just a little bit of effort on your part. And we can help you with that. But before we do so, we got to understand a little bit more about the background of what overactive bladder is and why is this such a pain in the neck as we get older. And it has to do, among other things, with the aging of the nervous system. Now, you know, your muscles and skin is innervated by a portion of your peripheral nervous system we call the somatic nervous system you have voluntary control over that at least most of the time um, but the autonomic nervous system the portion of your, your nervous system that brings nerve supply to the internal organs of your body including the bladder really isn't so much under the same kind of voluntary control right and it's kind of a good thing otherwise you'd have to think about it every time we wanted to take a breath or or maintain our blood pressure or heart rate right, or bladder function. But what happens when these nerves that you really don't have so much voluntary control over, the nerves that go to the bladder stop working properly? What's the consequence of them becoming un or less regulated? Well, the consequences are enormous and it doesn't just relate to bladder function. Let me explain what I mean by that. What if you have a medical condition that causes a uh, sleep disturbance. So you're not getting the kind of sleep you need to feel awake and fresh and energetic during the day. Are you less likely to do the kinds of things that bring you joy? Uh, what if you uh, have a bladder problem, uh, like overactive bladder, that's causing you emotional distress, anxiety, embarrassment, frustration? All of these things over time, chronically, can lead to depression. And there, pro there just isn't any other condition more relevant to quality of life. What about its impact on social life, your willingness to engage with friends, to go to events, to go to lunch, to go to dinner? If you're not sure there's going to be a bathroom available and you don't want to travel with a change of clothes, maybe you've had a bad experience because you had an accident in the past, you just don't want to risk it again, so you give up on those one by one cumulatively over time, that's going to have an enormous impact on your life and mental well-being. But also... This particular problem, overactive bladder, can lead to reduced physical activity. Now, reduced physical activity, which is basically another way of saying reduced physical fitness, increases your risk for having a fall, right? One bad fall can change everything for you. And we just can't uh, abide that, right? We have to do everything we can to limit the risk of that happening. We know that people with overactive bladder who do fall are more likely to experience hip fracture than people who fall of the same age without overactive bladder. So it speaks to a certain frailness that may be associated with a condition, and that must be avoided. 
And finally, what about interference with intimate relationships, right? Um, seniors are often uh, very pleased that they can still engage in intimacy with their partners. And this is a big obstacle for many women in particular. Um, fear of incontinence leads to changes in self-image that can have a direct impact on intimacy, sexuality. And so anyway, all of these things are worth protecting, are worth fighting for. All right, Dr. Crawford, that's well and good. Give me some practical things I can actually use. All right, let's get into that right away. We're not going to belabor the point any farther. Number one, the liquids we consume have a big effect on bladder function. And there's a few bad players that you need to think about. And it doesn't mean you have to eliminate them completely. You just need to be aware of the consequences of consuming these things. Turns out they're the things everybody really likes. Coffee, tea, alcohol, soda. Some people even say spicy food can irritate the bladder, make you urinate more often, give you symptoms of overactive bladder. And so I've got a lot of patients that just cannot consider giving up their morning coffee. That is one of their life pleasures, and they're just not even going to talk about it. Well, there are some compromises. Now, if you haven't already switched to decaf or even half-calf coffee, low-caffeinated coffee, you could consider doing that. There are some low-acid coffees available. You can find them online. It's easy. Just Google search for low-acid coffee. There'll be a bunch of choices. You can try those out. In general, coffees grown in Central America, um, sh sort of shaded varietals like coffees grown in Guatemala, for instance, tend to already have lower caffeine content than other types of coffee. Um, you know, instant coffee is going to have a lot of caffeine in it, right? That will wake you up. In coffee that's produced with a coffee maker that, like for instance, a Keurig that makes coffee in 30 seconds or, or less than a minute, where the hot water really isn't getting all that much time on the grounds, is not going to extract as much caffeine from those grounds as a pour-over slow drip coffee, right? So a Mr. Coffee that takes five or ten minutes to brew a pot of coffee is going to have more caffeine in it than um, a coffee maker that's producing your cup of coffee in just a few seconds. So that's something to think about also. Um, what else? You know, um, some people just don't want to make a change in the coffee they're drinking but are willing to cut back from two cups to one cup right? So maybe just cutting back the quantity. Now, alcohol has a number of different effects. One, it's a diuretic, right? It makes your body produce more urine. And so if you already have overactive bladder, this is just going to exacerbate it. And, and people with overactive bladder know this already. And many of them, not just with alcohol, many people will fluid restrict on their own. They'll just stop drinking any liquids after five or six o'clock at night because they know if they don't, they're going to be up all night long. As long as you're getting 60 to 80 ounces of water a day, ideally water, um, that is going to be adequate for most people to maintain normal hydration. Um, and so it's not a terrible thing to fluid restrict in the evenings, but it would be much better if you didn't have to do that. And that brings us to the second point. Overactive bladder is for sure related to pelvic floor performance. And if you've been watching this channel, you know I belabor this point, never stop talking about it. For heaven's sakes, we know, Dr. Crawford, pelvic floor exercise is important. But what matters isn't that you know pelvic floor exercise is important, it's that you practice pelvic floor exercise. And you know from listening to our videos that the Filates method offers you a much more efficient method of getting the effect of improved pelvic floor performance. What do I mean by that? Well, I just mean that because the Filates program is a program of movement that uses various different muscle groups in the body that naturally work in coordination with the pelvic floor to re-regulate or improve the regulation of the nerves that go to the bladder, you can get over 
and maintain being over symptoms of overactive bladder with a regular program. If you go to philates.com and check it out, you'll see a button on top that says P49. That's a two-hour online webinar available to everyone. It's affordable. It costs $49. And that, if you practice it, if you take it seriously and you practice five minutes in the morning twice a day, our data suggests you will probably be successful. And that means probably successful without a medication. And so I'd encourage everybody to consider that. Now, none of this is a substitute for healthcare, right? Everything that feels like overactive bladder isn't necessarily overactive bladder. So you still have to see your doctor. You gotta get the diagnosis made. But if you are sitting in the doctor's office and he says, yep, er, you do have overactive bladder. I'm gonna write you a prescription for this medication. And it might cause dry mouth and constipation. You can say, well, hold on. Now that I have the diagnosis, Give me 28 days before I have to start taking medication. 28 days is really the amount of time it takes to know whether or not you're going to respond to the Philates program. 80% of our participants are at least 50% improved in 28 days of training. And so it might be a way, once you have the diagnosis, to avoid taking a medication. Something to consider. But you know what? Say you're in that 20% that isn't responding. Um, and uh, to a program of pelvic floor exercise, and you do want to or need to start taking a medication, that's not a failure. It's not the end of the world. These medications can be very helpful. And just because they can cause dry mouth and constipation doesn't mean they will for you. And in addition to that, if you do have those side effects, they may not be terrible or intolerable, or you may be able to accommodate them in various different ways. Some people like walking around with sour candy to try and deal with dry mouth symptoms, and you know, maybe you have to add a stool softener or something like that to avoid constipation. You know, and a lot of people already have some degree of dry mouth and constipation because they're taking other medications that cause those same side effects, and they don't notice any difference when they add the uh, overactive bladder medication. In addition to that, there are some newer drugs now available for overactive bladder that don't cause dry mouth and constipation. Now, with these newer drugs, they kind of work on the, the, the other side of the uh, autonomic nervous system, right? You may remember from previous videos, the autonomic nervous system is made up of the parasympathetic nerves, which is what all of the traditional older overactive bladder drugs work on, and the sympathetic nervous system. And the newer drugs work on the sympathetic side to try and keep the bladder from contracting when you don't want it to. And they, you know, they work pretty well. And given that they don't cause dry mouth and constipation, a lot of people think these drugs are um, pretty handy. Now, if you're taking a blood pressure, pressure medication called metoprolol, your doctor may not be willing to prescribe these newer drugs. In addition to that, um, if you, you know, have elevated blood pressure hypertension that's not well controlled, then yeah, your doctor's probably not going to be comfortable prescribing this newer class of uh, medication. And regardless, if, if you do start this medicine, it's going to be important that you have a follow-up visit after a week or two of being on it to make sure that your blood pressure hasn't been adversely affected, right? And so that's a little bit of a pain in the neck, but if the medicine works for you long-term, fabulous. All right, so we talked about the fluids we consume. We talked, again, about pelvic floor exercise, and we talked about medication, but there's one other thing that you should consider. Now, we have made a video on bladder retraining, which you can go to. It's on this channel. Just go to the, It's titled Bladder Retraining, and it's a, a very detailed discussion of exactly how to do bladder retraining. But there's one element of bladder retraining that probably is the most critical, and that is making a decision, a conscious decision, that you are no longer going to run to the bathroom in a panic. Now, this implies that you might have an incontinent episode, right, at first. But the idea is that when you get that fearful feeling of urgency, like, oh my gosh, I might not make it to the bathroom, instead of running to the bathroom with your arms waving over your head in a panic, you don't. You stop. You sit down. You say, I remember what Dr. Crawford told me about this. I'm going to sit down, give myself a message of reassurance, take some slow, deep breaths, do a series of forceful pelvic floor contractions, Kegel exercises, and wait. That experience of urgency will pass, I promise. You might 
get wet at first, um, but ultimately it will pass. You know, an unwanted bladder contraction tends to last about 60 to 90 seconds. So if you can just sit there for a minute or a minute and a half and wait for it to pass and then get up and walk calmly to the bathroom, you'll begin to retrain your bladder. You'll begin to put yourself back in the driver's seat, if you will. And it's remarkable how effective this can be. You see, your mind is intimately related to bladder function. And making the decision that you're not going to abide the fearful experience of having an incontinent episode, but rather that you're going to sit down when that happens, give yourself a message of reassurance, do a series of strong pelvic floor contractions, and wait for the fearful experience to pass before walking calmly to the bathroom, can make a tremendous difference. Now, there's a bit more to a formal bladder retraining program that involves having a bladder diary and defining an interval that you can generally remain continent and then practice this technique for a period of time until you go a week, say, without an incontinent episode and then extending that interval. Maybe you start it at 30 minutes and then you extend it by 15 minutes to 45 minutes and then when you're dry for a week or two at 45 minutes, extending it to an hour until you're voiding every two to three hours. It can take several months to accomplish this. But again, it's something that you can do. It's something that you have control over. So I'd encourage you to check out the full video on bladder retraining, but know that the most important part of it is the conscious decision that you are no longer going to run to the bathroom in a panic. It can really make a big difference. Right, well, that is a lot of information. Hopefully you took some notes. But we're producing new content all the time, usually two or three videos a week, and there's going to be more coming in this senior series, so stay tuned for that. If you like this, if you thought these suggestions, these practical tips, things you can do on your own were helpful, please like this video, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, maybe share the video with a friend. That will really help us reach more people. I'm so grateful for your time and attention today, and we're going to see you soon.